just by way of introduction, since I failed to do that earlier, is Jennifer Lin. I am the director of Crossref, um, of director of products, um, product development at Crossref, and um, also the director of getting things wrong. So um, if there is anything wrong, please come to me, and I will direct you to the people that will fix it, <laughs> of all things. No, but um, seriously, moving on ahead, the talk today is to piggyback off of Trisha's um, earlier conversation, uh, discussion about metadata and event data. So the, I, I will, many of you have heard the story about what event data is. Um, I'm gonna give a particularly different angle with examples. Hopefully some of them will be interesting if not scintillating enough that this will flesh out more about what event data actually is as one of our newest service in production. So this is a narrative structure as graphed in Script Magazine. I kid you not, there is such thing for you budding screenwriters out there. And I selected this particular narrative structure graph for its distinct likeness to a real, meaning faux, scientific graph. So you have time in minutes at the bottom. You have the somewhat um, janky font that um, a lot of us have seen at research conferences. You have state um, on the y-axis, and over time you see the development of the what is here, the story. What type of story? Well, this is a template. It could be a bank heist, it could be a rom-com, it could be a bank heist rom-com. Um, apply the structure and bam, you've got a film. The girl gets the object of her affection, both the love of her life and the vault to the Federal Reserves. And then she, I don't know, rides out to the wilderness where she lives happily ever after. And then by the ending, the story closes, the credits roll and everyone um, exits with their half-eaten tub of popcorn. So basically, this is the story of the research project, right? Um, well, talking to research, in fact, is actually not quite that different. The cells don't grow. That's your first um, inciting incident. The hunches lead nowhere. That's pinch number one or pinch number two. Um, you get a break before then the organism goes extinct, um, and then you have to reach for an adjacent species, etc. Climax, though, you pull your findings together, you publish the paper, ending. This is a victory. Where life is different from researchers is that the story goes on as we all know. Once the paper's published, other labs read it and they try to replicate your work. And then they talk about their attempts to try to or not or fail to replicate the work and thereby possibly tearing your findings a new one. So, um, not so much. It's as if Goldilocks grows up and becomes an astronaut in this film, right? Or Alice in the Wonderland falls for the wildness of the woods, becomes a forest ranger in the Yosemites, where there are in fact stranger and crazier animals than the Cheshire Cat, the Mock Turtle, and the Dormouse. So quite different, some similarities. Just to tie it back to um, what a man said yesterday, the following words, which I'll dare not repeat myself, you can see. But. Um, Sometimes your content also itself follows suit and goes where your content never goes. Third parting reading environments, sharing platforms, there's tons of ways in which researchers are accessing um, and engaging with content in the, in the digital world. Open access content, all the more so. So event data is one of the part pieces of this picture here because we all know that the publisher metadata, the members that register their content with us, is one side of the story surrounding the research outputs. There are conversations, ideas that build further around scholarly research that take place all over the web. So here we are, shared scholarly infrastructure, co-developed with data site, um, what we call event data. These events are in a very, very broad name for any of the types of things that come into the larger system outside of the publisher platforms or the types of um, metadata that cannot be provided within our current schema. So here's a smattering, it's a first cut list of our growing set of sources. It's what we have today. It is certainly not what we plan to have six months, 12 months down the line. But as you can see, there's a whole host of, a whole variety of different sources, types of events, that event data is already currently capturing. And currently capturing for all 100 plus million of, of Crossref DOIs, as well as all, every single one of the data site DOIs as well, as the shared scholarly infrastructure. And as Trisha mentioned, the use data set usage is a really big part of what they're working on, that um, taking and, um, and, and cleaning and processing the usage to be counter compliant, 
um, but how are they made available? They, uh, they, we will be having, we will be making all of the data set usage, hits, downloads, and so forth made available in event data pretty soon. So this, just to come back to the overall theme, it's the publisher metadata or the member metadata between the Crossref um, corpus as well as the data site corpus combined with events that we're capturing on all of the DOIs across the two organ research um, registration agencies. That is the fuller picture. So at this point, I'm going to provide a few examples that cut across some of the areas that Crossref has been talking about over the years of what we do. As many of you recall, a number of years ago, we started up a new content type, preprints, right? In order to be able to accommodate the, um, the type of content that some of our members were already registering with us, but um, without its own dedicated content type. Um, and and uh, other community members who were very, very much um, chomping at the bit to be incorporated into the overall Crossref framework. So we have preprints. We, and one, as you also recall, that one of the specific obligations and terms that um, comes along with registering a preprint is that subsequent to the deposition of the preprint or the, um, the publishing of the preprint, the repository um, shall update their metadata in Crossref as well as link directly from their platform um, to any subsequently published papers in, in journals, et cetera. So um, what I'm going to do is show you an example where a particular research project started off um, in BioArchive as a preprint um, and then was published subsequently later, a year um, afterwards. So Daniel MacArthur and his team, a number of colleagues, um, worked as part of the Exome Aggregation Consortium project. They worked on the generation and analysis of high quality exome sequencing data. Um, and this was one of the first instances where they, um, there was a diverse study, a comprehensive cataloging of human protein coding genetic variations um, across 60,706 individuals of diverse ancestry. The results yielded, um, you know, extremely unprecedented re resolution for the analysis of rare variants across multiple human populations. And the upshot of that is that this piece of work provides a critical reference panel for subsequent clinical interpretation of genetic variants, as well as the discovery of disease-related genes, which is one of the, you know, big, big uh, motivators for this type of work. The, 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 as a preprint, um, it was released, it, and over the course of the many years since October 2015, there was, it got picked up. Um, it was picked up by researchers who published subsequent papers. You see citations for it. There were also quite a lot of discussions and news write-up of the preprint itself. It got recommended in F1000 Prime. Um, once it was published in Nature, also, we see a lot of discussion by the community um, online through social media, online through discussion boards, through recommendation platforms, um, picked up by reporters, um, picked up by researchers who then subsequently cited it. These are all discussions that are happening and we're beginning to see a bigger picture of a particular set of research results as it's been shared in different forms over, since um, October 31st, 2015. Another one of the things that we really talk quite a lot about, and Jody re referenced this last um, yesterday, was scholarly updates. Um, we know that there are the, as scientific results are put out there, and there is a you know a um, an outpouring of interest of of other labs trying to better understand and replicate the results. There's going to be some instances in which knowledge progresses in a way that either confirms or not only partially confirms or rejects the sort the, the actual results put forward. So here we have an example of a type of technology that the world has been hearing so much about CRISPR-Cas9, right? Um, and in this paper, um, there was a lab led by Mitali, Mitalipov who actually was able to, according to his paper, correct a mutation in, new, in a newly fertilized embryo. So they took normal human eggs, fertilized them with a sperm containing a mutant version of a gene, 
which is specifically the gene that is associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, one of the most common sudden death um, cases in young athletes. So to be able to correct this mutation in the embryo is a groundbreaking piece of research. So it was published in August 2nd, 2017 in Nature. It was a lot of, it, it, um, the floodgates were open every, because of the technology it's, itself, because of the results. And um, Nature put out an in situ um, editorial note on October 2nd. Um, alerting readers that some of the conclusions of this paper are subject to critiques that are currently under consideration by the editors. And then um, subsequent to that, also in Nature, this was a discussion paper. Um, the, an, another lab came forward and said, we've looked at all of the data, we've done quite a lot of additional experiments on our end, and we have a lot of cr questions and concerns surrounding how the CRISPR complex could have gotten a hold of the type of wild type gene, um, given the, the way that the experiment was set up. This was a group that was led by Dieter Egli. It also included George Church, of those um, uh, many of you have heard of. So it was very interesting to come back um, after a certain period of time where this team had a lot of opportunity to think through and, and conduct experiments on their own. They were not the only ones to do so. There was a second discussion paper also published, um, led by um, the um, Fatwat Adikasumi, um, and their concerns was that there were the original lab did not consider the large deletion failures, and, and perhaps that also questioned some of um, the, the confidence of, of, of the results in the original paper. And then as we know, the um, original team the, um, of, of researchers, those who published the first paper, um, considered all of the, these critiques, they came back with an author reply and presented more data, which, which to many seems to provide more confirmation of the original results, although the verdict is largely out. No surprise, this is how research, this is how knowledge advances itself. So this maybe is pointing in this direction of perhaps understand, uh, understanding new mechanisms and um, fundamentally new mechanisms and how early embryos progress. But it's also possible that a year from now we'll view this entirely different. And the thing that event data does is, as well as with the publisher metadata, is that it t brings all of these different publish um, publications together, and it um, showcases how these conversations are happening across the board. These are events on the right that are coupled with the, the metadata deposited by, um, by the publisher of each of these publications. All right, moving on. So data, data citations, data linking to literature. This is obviously something that is very, very important. Um, we have this amazing data set that has been um, yearly updated. It was first published in, I think it was 1996, um, but it's a longitudinal study that is done by NASA and deposited with the National Snow and Ice Data Center. So this one single data set on the left-hand side has seen 65 different papers that have cited, that are associated um, with this data set. Okay, and there's also been some events surrounding this specific data set that we're talking about. Um, but what, if we do a deeper dive into this and we look at the fuller picture across time, across these two very important types of work, the data set itself and the corpus of 65 papers published subsequent to the data set being released into the wild, we see then quite a lot of other activity that have happened not only on the data set itself, but also the published findings in journal articles. And here is just one small view of the um, types of events that have come out of the actual papers that publish. If the DOI, you have the title of the paper and then a smattering of the events that have occurred. Some of these are, are news media, blog posts, discussions about the data. Some of these are social media shares. Some of these are discussions on discussion boards. Some of them are um, the publishers themselves linking from that paper to the data set. What I want to say here is that this particular linkage at the very bottom, I know this is linked because from the data data site end, the, um, they know from the data center, from the data repository, that this data set was cited by this paper. On our end, however, we did not know this. And so this paper itself does not have a linkage back from the paper 
to the data set. And here we go, this is part of the shared scholarly infrastructure that we're talking about, where it's data sites with their member repositories providing metadata about the data sets. It's Crossref's members, um, you guys providing metadata about your publications to the extent that you know of, and then supplement it all together with the events that surround both the data sets as well as the research papers that came out of it. Okay. So there is a live stream events that if you have time, it's kind of a fun thing to do. And I'm gonna have to actually get out in order to give you a sense of what this looks like. This is actually a streaming of all of the events as they are being processed to the extent that Wi-Fi is working. And it may not be. Um, Okay, so I will provide a link to this particular um, fun page where you see a million plus different events just streaming through as they, the moment that they are created in the event data system. We'll provide that for another time. Um, but it is a stream, and we call it a stream specifically to capture the description that there are many things going, um, many events being generated at every single moment in time, whether they are new Wikipedia edits or Wikipedia mentions um, on pages that point to a data set and or a publication, or conversations happening online, journal articles um, being read um, and, 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 and mentioning, etc. So the... Um, Let's go back here. Life's a stream. It's all out, up, all up to how you interpret it. This one thing I'm just going to talk a little bit, a bit more about. So event data is not about metrics. We've heard about how metrics are created as a result of events in the Make Data Count projects. But events themselves are not metrics. And this, events themselves are metadata, adding up to a fuller story. And it's about the story that you want to tell, whether that is um, in, a, in a numerical form, quantitative form, or in a qualitative form, that actually imputes um, meaning to the actual metadata that you see. And so it, it is all up to interpretation. And here we go. Event data is a stream, all up to how you interpret it. No metrics, but you get the fuller picture. Okay. So there we go. That's event data in a pinch. Um, I think, I guess I will take questions because we have a little bit more time before um, our next presentation. Hi, Jennifer. Stephanie Hofstein, just if you forgot who I was. <laughs> um, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you for taking the time to tell the story behind the metrics because um, that's like linking back to the, the question I had earlier, like how should people that are up for tenure change things? So if they had a Jennifer Lynn coming up to the Research Tenure and Promotion Committee and tell the story, I think that what should metrics be link, uh, used for, and especially those um, you know, that are usage, that are alt metrics, that are things that we can all capture, but it also goes back to citations, like looking what happened and telling a story makes so much more sense than using just the raw numbers. So thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Hi again, Gunter Eisenbach from JMU Publications. Um, this is great. Uh, as a publisher, I'm just wondering how, how can we, how should we display this data? So do you have any best practices or even software or examples for publishers who display this kind of data? How, sh how should they be visualized for the end user? Thank you, Guther. Very good question. Um, and I will speak a little bit more about this in the afternoon when I talk, when I come back and, and, and natter on to you, everyone, once more. But to, to loosely address your question right now, that we have an API by which those who wish to pull the events, um, the real-time live events, can do so. Now, it still begs the question, as a publisher, you have an API, what do you actually do with this metadata? And, and I think that this is very much a conversation that I, my, myself, those of us who are all working on event data at Crossref and DataSite would love to, to talk more with the publishers about. Because we have certainly some ideas in how it might enrich um, the, the, um, the platforms that you run 
and it might in fact also help drive some of the the other tools that you have, whether they be um, recommendations that you offer their readers, whether they be to help power some of the navigation and discovery tools that you provide your researchers. Um, all of you publishers, you have tons of content. How do you get this content to your readers? That is the eternal question, and I think that um, the, the question will never be answered because we are always coming up with newer ways in which we can make improvements on this. So loosely speaking, I think there are many different areas, larger, higher level areas, which publishers might consider how the, the event metadata may be useful to your operations. Some of it may be for your marketing, it may be for um, your platforms, it may be to help find reviewers um, based upon, you know, some combination of the events that you can get out of the event data API combined with a lot of the internal private confidential information you have as well as other public sources as well as the Crossref, um, the, the, the publisher metadata in the corpus. Yes, back here. Hi there, uh, James from PKP. I just I had a comment following up on Gunther's uh, question there, and a question too. Sorry, this echo is freaking me out. <laughs> Um, so, uh, PKP, we're working with a group called Impact Story to develop a sort of a display overlay on top of Crossref's event data uh, called Paper Buzz. And that's um, originally developed for open journal systems, but I don't think it's exclusive to open journal systems either. So, uh, Gunther, if you're looking for some means to display that, um, just follow up with the Impact Story folks or uh, um, look for Paper Buzz online. I think it's paperbuzz.org. Um, and just a quick question. Um, Jennifer, you had mentioned, and I think Chuck also mentioned yesterday, that you're doing um, filtering of the usage data coming in, uh, and you mentioned counter compliance there. I just wonder, just a quick question. That's like uh, bots exclusion, multi clicks, that kind of stuff that you're looking at? Or? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the two um, components that mm -hmm. you just listed. Um, the counter, uh, they have filter rules for uh, bots. Yes. So robots, crawlers, that kind of stuff. Y yes. So Datasite has been working with the counter group to update their code of practice to accommodate um, how to process data set usage um, with their, their current policy framework that they have. Um, and so this, this has been a close collaboration that is really important since Counter serves as currently our industry area central source for, for, for usage counting, absolutely. Um, this, um, the Counter use, the usage that Datasite is picking up we, um, is not available in event data yet, but hopefully will be so in the next month or two. Okay. okay. Uh, if